In 2011, Egypt was in political turmoil. The Arab Spring, as it was called, was a series of protests all throughout the region against corrupt governments, and Egypt was hit particularly hard. Now, this affected different nations in different ways, but one thing was the same no matter where you went. Social media usurped mainstream media as the way to get your news. No more of the waiting for two days or waiting for confirmation or any of those things. For better or for worse, the cat was out of the bag. And now, 50 different angles of the same exact event from 50 different people all being live streamed at the same time to social media. This was the new norm to the point where now it's not uncommon at all to see Facebook and Twitter and TikTok cited as sources in the New York Times, for example. It's crazy to those of us that are old, right? Now, we, we reached a point where even people like myself, I mean, I'm 48 years old and I haven't watched the news for media to, for, to, for like to gain knowledge for like forever, man. And why, why would I do that? I just get on the internet and look. So my point is the torch was passed at that time. Now, in my estimation, History for Granite has done the exact same thing with his latest video. He has basically displaced academia as the premier source of information on Egyptology and it's now YouTubers. Um, I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but check this out. He goes to Egypt and he takes pictures of the Bent Pyramid. And his first video after he comes back is better photographs of the chimney of the Bent Pyramid than any academics ever put out there. And the next video is his examination of the air shafts or the star shafts. And it makes a pretty compelling case as to why they are for ventilation. But his latest video kicks in the door of what the Great Pyramid was used for. And it, it's a very compelling case, very well backed up, and it changes the entire landscape. I mean, it, it, this, it makes this video good that we're about to go into great because we are totally in uncharted waters here. So bear with me. We're going to have a lot of fun. Hi, my name is Dan and welcome to Dunking. Now, if you haven't seen his latest video yet, you should check it out. But the basic takeaway of it is the portcullis system that's in the Great Pyramid was designed for repeated use. And coupled with the air shafts being for ventilation, it really looks like the Great Pyramid was not a tomb. Not a tomb. Yes, Arnold, not a tomb, or at least not exclusively a tomb. And History for Granted makes a great case, and I don't really want to steal any views from his video, even though my channel's smaller. So you should totally check his video out. But... Suffice it to say that it, his position is robust enough that I feel confident working from there to make other hypotheses. And in this one, that's exactly what we're going to do. So, so uh, hang on tight because we're going to have some fun. We're going to examine the ancient Egyptian funerary rites for the pharaoh from a different perspective. Now, the Book of the Gates and the Book of the Amduat are basically the same, but there's a few minor differences. Uh, definitely one influenced the other, but it's kind of a chicken or the egg scenario. We're not really sure which one is which. Now, they both describe the nighttime journey of the sun as it goes through the underworld. As, you know, it sets and then comes back around and rises, it was considered to go through the underworld. And this is a symbolic journey of resurrection. And there are 12 hours prescribed in the Book of the Amdua or the Book of the Gates. Now in this one, I'm going to be using the Book of the Gates because the Book of the Gates is a little bit more about the Pharaoh himself. And again, it's kind of chicken or the egg scenario. But the fact that these two do have a little bit of the hours are juxtaposed in one spot for sure does kind of support my hypothesis. Um, I'll explain that a little bit at the end. Uh, if I remember to. And I'll be reading portions of the interpretation of each section from the book, The Ancient Egyptian Books of the Afterlife by Eric Hornung. Link in the description. Also, I won't be repeating perhaps or maybe or any of those kinds of qualifiers over and over again. This is speculation based on a handful of things that I'm laying out here. So perhaps and maybe you're, you're we're talking about thousands of years ago ancient history, man. Yes, perhaps and maybe apply. All right, without further ado, let's look into the ancient funerary rites of the pharaoh. The first hour begins with the king entering the realm of the dead, and the sun god is greeted by the gods of the west, a group of deities. This is an in-between space, considered a gateway to the netherworld, kind of a liminal space, right? Depictions of both a ram's head and a jackal's head are symbolic of the rewards and punishments of the sun god. The pharaoh is shown as a scarab in a solar boat, preparing to travel through the underworld. As above, so below, the movements of the earth and sky are intertwined, one informs the other. With this in mind, the pharaoh's body is embalmed at Saqqara and prepared for his journey through the underworld. 
As symbolized by the scarab in the solar boat, the pharaoh is in a dualistic form. The scarab is the symbol of the daytime sun, but here it is prepared to enter the night, into the underworld. To this end, in the real world, the embalmed body is placed on a boat, a ceremonial craft made for this purpose alone, and the journey through the underworld is undertaken on the lands of Egypt itself. Perhaps one month, representing one hour. Over the course of the next year, the pharaoh would emulate the journey his soul was said to be taking. In his wake would be several dozens, perhaps hundreds, of wealthy deceased, the embalmed remains of the elite who could afford to tag along with the god king on his journey through the darkness. After all, pharaohs only die once every 20, 40 years or so. It's not hard to imagine several wealthy deceased waiting for the next pharaoh's death to tag along on this pilgrimage. In the second hour, the duality of life and death is driven home, as is the difference between the underworld and the earth itself. We see both the blessed dead and the damned. We also see four men lying down, said to represent the cardinal points and the exhaustion even these immutable directional markers are experiencing in the underworld. Even the four directions are worn out here. It is not a friendly place. From Saqqara, the pharaoh has a solar boat drugged to the Nile and he sets off on a voyage. Countless words, spells, blessings, and rewards would be performed in order to protect him and support him on his journey. As the Nile was reached, one bank would be viewed as the living side, the other the dying side. One bank metaphorically the blessed dead side and the other representing the damned. The solar boat would sail south, perhaps stopping along the way to make offerings and solidify the connection between the people and the royalty, allowing the families of the deceased who followed the peril to perform rituals over their loved one's remains. This is quite possibly the biggest national pride event to occur in a single lifetime, and those in power are well aware of the potential here. In the third hour, we see mummies represented. Apophis, or Apep, the serpent god of darkness, enemy of light and order, is also present. There is a lake of fire, dualistically nourishing the blessed and consuming the damned. The solar boat shows signs of being drugged through the ground. The exact words of the text are, The sun god is towed along in the bark of the earth. Bark is the word for solar arc. And it claims that this is symbolic. I believe this was more than just symbolic. I believe the solar boat traveled south from Saqqara until it reached an area near present-day Alwasta. From there it was placed on a sled and hauled through the desert about 25 miles until they reached Lower Wadi El Ryan Lake. This lake is known for its three sulfuric springs, hot vents that smell like Hades itself, the lake of fire and the place of death and life. Here no doubt rituals to conquer Apep were performed, with this being the first major stop on the journey this site probably attracted a huge crowd, the beginning of the pharaoh facing the underworld proper and the beginning of this year-long festival. Alternatively, it is possible this was all done in secret, although I personally find that hard to believe. Upper and Lower Egypt had once been separate lands, not long before the first dynasty began. The cultural divide would be potentially problematic to those in power, and events like this, where both Upper and Lower Egypt could be incorporated to immortalize the pharaoh, would have immense propaganda value, value that I think few astute politicians of the day would miss. As such, I believe these events were most likely public affairs and probably drew a very large crowd, at least of the elite in the area. Furthermore, if there was a following of other deceased, this would not be easy to hide. Any outdoor rites would be seen. Hour 4 shows two lakes depicted, one the Lake of Life and the other the Lake of Uri, the serpents on the pharaoh's headdress, a symbol of a fiery serpent associated with the sun. Mummies are shown being resurrected and nourished by the sun god. Time itself is represented, the twelve hours shown as twelve people, and Osiris is shown protected on all sides from his would-be enemies. Finally, as Horus attends to his dead father's needs, fiery pits consume the enemies of the gods. The pharaoh's bark is removed from the lake and placed again on a sled, hauled about 10 miles north to the lakes of Upper Wadi El Ryan and Lake Morris. Only the wealthiest families of the other deceased could afford to take their actual loved ones' bodies on such a journey. Most would be taken there by a symbolic clay boat and a piece of their hair or a fingernail or something like that, a small solar boat being one of the many effigies we found in the record. Now, dual lakes within 10 miles of each other today, during the flood season and the pre-water management days, these lakes would almost straddle each other. Two bodies of water and the space in between for rituals would be perfect for this scene, dualism between the two bodies of water allowing for all forces to be present in a spiritual sense. 
Sacrifices would almost certainly be part of these rituals, and the execution of criminals by fire would also be done at this time, symbolically purging Egypt of the evil and incorporating the good only through the travels of the underworld. After the rituals were performed, the bark would be hauled back to the Nile, the body protected by the locals to represent the increased security depicted in the Book of the Gates. The busy fifth hour shows the dead laying out of space, measuring out a place for them to exist in. The serpent Apep is restrained, and the four races of Egyptian cosmology are represented, and all are assured a place in the afterlife. Their souls, including those of the Egyptians, are protected in the afterlife. Also depicted is a large image of Osiris judging the dead and all other evil deities being driven off. The solar arc is still carrying the deceased, protected from evil. The bark traveled south, soon arriving at Edfu. The famous temple was built much later, but as far back as the Third Dynasty, there were sanctuaries here, places of worship. The solar boat's entourage goes to the designated area for the eventual temple and measures out a prescribed area in a symbolic manner, connecting the deceased and the afterlife rituals and measuring out a place that would eventually become the Temple of Edfu. The four corners of this measurement are made by a representative of each of the four races of the Egyptian cosmology. This both enabled the gods to recognize people whose ancestors had not performed the proper rituals, but it also let each of these races know that they had a place in the Egyptian afterlife. They were not excluded. Most likely, a special place was given to people who had loved ones in the Pharaoh's entourage, the deceased, <laughs> the carnival of souls, right? The four races being represented not only in ritual, but in the wealthy families who were benefiting from the ritual would be powerful propaganda. Like I said before, the political advantage to be gained would not be ignored by the good politicians of the day. Each of these representatives takes a snake, perhaps several snakes, or most likely hires a snake handler, and sacrifices them to emulate the gods dispatching APAP, at least temporarily. The sixth hour is prefaced by Osiris judging the deceased, and it follows this up with symbols of rebirth and resurrection. Mummies are laid out on a serpent, almost like a reincarnation assembly line. Once again, the snake god of darkness, Apap, is subdued, and at the very end we see a lake of fire in a circle, perhaps protected or guarded somehow. Now here is where the rubber meets the road, or the papyrus meets the pen, whatever metaphor you like. The sacred lake at Karnak is the site eventually, but the wet-ass area that was there before the sacred lake was constructed was the site of the sixth hour, and it was when the public witnessed rites performed over their loved ones. More snakes were dispatched by burning in the waters where the temples would eventually be built, and the rituals of resurrection were performed on each mummy, with the length of time spent and the amount of embellishments dependent on the money that they were spent, of course. The waters were covered in pitch or some other flammable substance, and the top of the water was set alight. Many different families would hire serpent handlers to put serpents in clay jars and throw them into the water. Some of these would die, but some of them would not burn and escape. Those who escaped were said to have been blessed, and these were then sacrificed in a prescribed manner to immobilize Apep, and was also considered a great boon to the deceased who was represented by that snake. A lot of time was spent here, to the point where people were supposed to be satisfied with their loved ones on their way to the stars in the north. Ultimately, this was the goal of all Egyptians when they died. The stars around the North Pole aren't seasonal, so they are viewed as eternal. As these souls were preparing to travel to the North Stars, the next hour of travel through the underworld was emulated in this same region. In the seventh hour, the focus on removing opposing spiritual powers is highlighted, as is the reward for the faithful. In front of the solar boat sits the stakes of Geb, the god of earth and the bringer of serpents. Tied to the snakes are two enemies of Ra. Both are being tormented by demons with Ra's approval. Much of the rest of the hour is filled with images and descriptions of fertile farmland and mountains of grain, enough work for all the blessed dead. The wicked are annihilated, while the blessed dead are sheltered in the mott. The bark has moved closer to the Nile, but not far from the last location. Here at Karnak, granaries have been present for eons. The surplus of Nile silt allows the entire delta to produce incredible amounts of food after the floods, and Karnak was no exception. Here the solar boat was filled with grains and breads and cakes and beer, with the people following along or attending the ceremonies feasting on the fruits of the Nile. In stark contrast, two of the worst criminals in the recent times were tied to a stake and punished in some of the most horrific ways imaginable. 
As effigies of the evil spirits who stood between the blessed dead and the resurrection, these criminals were punished in a symbolic way, making their torments quite possibly the worst inflicted in ancient Egypt. The bodies of these and other criminals are thrown into the fire and burnt to ash, which is sprinkled into the Nile, obliterating their wickedness from the two lands and solidifying the purity of the blessed dead as they get closer to the end of their journey. Like the sixth hour, the eighth hour portrays time as an endless rope. The solar boat is said to produce mysteries, and the mummies are now firmly in the process of being resurrected. The dualistic good versus evil theme is reiterated here, as is the making certain enough provisions are included, thanks to the gods. This is where I believe the mystery starts to unravel, and, well, a new set of mysteries, of course, is presented to us. The solar boat comes to rest on the shores of Deshur, and the funeral procession marches toward the bent pyramid. The place is symbolically opened and the gates raised. Here the followers and loved ones of the deceased are forced to either wait nearby or return home, as the rites here take the better part of a month. As you can see from this image of the Book of the Am Duat, the related text to the Book of the Gates that I'm citing here, the passages between the hours strongly resemble pyramid corridors. The secret rites performed over the blessed dead, or perhaps their effigies, are completed, with the pharaoh of course getting extra special treatment. Then the place is sealed, only the deceased remain inside for a few weeks. After this time has passed, the pyramid is open and the bodies return to the bark. This was the beginning of the secret rites, the first time since the embalmment that the public couldn't view the rituals as they occurred. In the ninth hour, there's a large rectangle of water containing the drowned. Four groups of four dead people float here, but they are being regenerated by the waters, as these are the holy waters of Nun, the sky goddess. It is said that they will breathe air through their nostrils and not be destroyed. By contrast, we see more wicked souls being destroyed by fire. Now thanks to the Nile's unique winds, it only takes a few days for the bark to arrive at Abdos, and the short trip from the river to the Osirion is quickly undertaken. At this rectangle of water, the procession enters in one end, with the criminals of the region being burnt for their crimes near enough to be visible. As the procession enters these waters, each of the 16 chambers in the Osirion is utilized for symbolic baptism, I guess you could say. Each of these different poses depicted is replicated in these four chambers, and when this is done, they exit on the opposite side, having imbued the pharaoh and the blessed dead with the regenerative waters of the sky goddess Nun. In the tenth hour, we see the battle against Apep coming to a head. Fourteen gods carry nets to battle with him, and these are said to remove his powers. He is subdued by the Old One, and who this is referring to is not exactly known, and two serpents help to punish Apep. The sun god is depicted in two different forms here. While being called the scarab, he's shown as the falcon. Scarab being nighttime and falcon being daytime depictions of the sun god. We're then told the rest of the journey is headed towards the sky. The solar boat heads north again, this time to Giza. What we call Khufu's pyramid is the goal, the Great Pyramid. Inside, the battle against Apep was held, and it was held for weeks, a spiritual battle requiring constant effort from the living. As such, the body of the pharaoh was brought into the edifice, followed by priests and the other required people for performing these rites. The doors were sealed behind them. A shift change every 12 hours symbolically allowed for different groups of people to attend to different subsections of this hour, and it allowed a very real break from the rituals. No doubt this involved all parts of the structure, the unfinished lower section symbolizing the underworld and the ascending corridors and eventual peak formed by the king's chamber giving a path to the soul, a way for it to navigate this, the most intense part of the travel through the underworld. When this part was completed successfully, the ritual was almost done. The king now had one foot in the sky. The eleventh hour shows the god Apep dismembered and powerless. The blessed dead are able to look at the face of Ra, and this is supposed to be instrumental in their rejuvenation. The sun god comes after the stars that announce his arrival. The oarsmen of the gods start to assist the bark, and the heralds begin to announce the arrival of those who will now accompany the rising sun. The Great Pyramid is opened again, and the body of the pyramid is moved to Khafre's Pyramid. This time there is no need for continuous rituals and recitations, so the body is placed inside, the rituals are performed, then it is sealed for prescribed time. The rituals again no doubt include the lower and upper burial chambers, and the symbolic conquering of the underworld is now almost complete. 
During the time the body was interred, the final preparations are made for the last hour. The twelfth and final hour describes the gate with the mysterious entrance and how it is crucial for the final transformation of the soul. The bark remains as it has been throughout the journey, but its enemies are all gone, and Apep lies broken and impotent. Those leaving the netherworld are presented with heavenly crowns, and although this is all celebrated, the fact that Osiris must remain in the underworld is lamented. Pharaoh is removed from the second pyramid and transferred to Menkari's pyramid, the smallest of the three. Osiris, also the constellation of Orion, is emulated by all three pyramids here but backwards, including in size. The brightest star is emulated by the smallest pyramid. Thus the Pharaoh's body was moved into the pyramid and the final rites performed for the completion of the journey to the northern stars. His body was laid in the sarcophagus like it was in the other pyramids used for this ritual, but this time it was left there perhaps for decades. Until the ritual is performed again, this pharaoh would lie here, his soul being allowed plenty of time to navigate the final leg of the journey, making it through those mysterious doors spoken of in this panel. And with this, the priesthood had secured the lineage, the connection between the pharaoh and the sun, the undying northern stars, and the conquering of death was complete. Now obviously there's a lot of speculation here, but this really isn't anything novel to be honest. I mean, all I've done is really take the words that they wrote, look for places that would coincide with it because some of the imagery resembles the corridors of the pyramids and one of the books is called the the book of the caves which is a book of spells but it describes 12 different caves and it would make sense that a pyramid or something like that would be a natural or unman-made cave excuse me and things like the Osirian they seem to fit pretty well in this whole scenario there um so it, 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 anyway it kind of seems to me like this is a very viable hypothesis. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% accurate. Of course, some of the sites are going to be wrong. I, I, even though it came from me, I'm sure there's a mistake or two in there. It also gives us some great undertones to think about here. For example, Menkari's Pyramid is one that was said to have like held all these riches and stuff according to local traditions. And, uh, well, that would kind of make sense if it was the one that held bodies for a really long time, wouldn't it? And... It also kind of ties into, like I said, to the whole propaganda thing. When you're trying to unify a country of, of like disparate people all across the region and all across the area, you, you can tie them together with these ceremonies once in a lifetime, if nothing else, remind them they're all part of Egypt. Also, this would create like, this would be a once in a lifetime opportunity for a lot of craftsmen and for the like. Imagine being a snake handler and they're going to put all those snakes in the fire pit, for example, right? I mean, man, this is your lucky day. This is your chance to go make a bunch of money. Or if you're somebody who makes little uh, freaking clay boats for them to float down the thing, the barks. If you're one of those people that makes those, the same kind of thing. It's like, man, you've got... This, this is the one time of year you're really going to crank in the dough. So you can imagine these entourages following this whole procession around and then being told to piss off at certain points. It, it makes for a, a, a interesting picture in your mind if you stop and think about it. Also, this ties in heavily with the Orion-Giza correlation, and it kind of confirms it. I mean, this would make a lot of sense that these stars that are said to emulate Osiris would be the last stop on the way out of the underworld. You say goodbye to Osiris and then you go into the world of Ra, into the daytime sun, not the nighttime sun of Osiris. So that makes a lot of sense there. And for those who are unaware, the Orion Giza correlation does have fourth dynasty dating that has been found by archaeoastronomers. It's not all entirely 10th dynasty or 10,000 years ago, excuse me, 12,000 years ago. I'll put a link in the description like I have for uh, regular viewers. You've definitely looked into that before if you're interested in that sort of thing. But it is worth pointing out that it doesn't necessarily have to go way on back. This, this can fit in right in, in line with the mainstream timeline. And Again, it ties in with their religion heavily. It makes a lot of sense. And now while this is speculative, I do think it's plausible. And what's really important to me here is that the door that History for Granite kicked in with this is so huge that I can make this kind of, of hypothesis and six months ago I could not have. Before the whole mainstream narrative was the pyramids were tombs full stop. If you say otherwise, you're, you're just wrong. And now, man, you know what? Nah, man, nah. There's there's good evidence to say that they were a lot more than just tombs. And you can thank history for granted for that. Now, don't blame him for this entire video. It, this wasn't no collaboration or anything. This was this was all me just 
building off of what he made so don't don't blame him for this this isn't like you know saying that the beatles influenced all music so that they have to own offspring or something like that that's god damn i'm old ain't i whoo that's a 30 year old joke there geez louise Anyway, I want to thank you all very much for watching this far. I want to thank History for Granite for laying the groundwork for me to come and do all this shenanigans with. I want to thank my patrons very much for supporting me and giving me the confidence to keep doing this sort of thing. And, and you know, thank all the rest of you for hate watching or whatever it is that you do. And click buttons down below and I, I hope to see you all next time.